Crystal. I'm a senior fellow in the Global Health Policy Center at CSIS. And I am privileged and honored to have this great panel of some of the world's experts on this issue. Um, we have David Granger on the far left, on my far left. He is the senior director of global public policy for Eli Lilly and Company. David supports the company's policy positions related to health technology assessment and works with governments and others on universal health coverage issues. Calypso Chakadu is founding director of NICE International, the international arm of the UK's well-regarded health policy body, the National Institute for Health and National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. Right. Um, Calypso helps governments build technical and institutional capacity for using evidence to inform health policy. Akiko Maeda is lead health specialist at the World Bank. She has more than 20 years experience in international health and social development programs, providing policy <coughs> advice to senior government officials in health policy reform. And last but not least, we have Tessa Tentoris Editor, coordinator of the unit of costs, effectiveness, efficiency, and priority setting at the World Health Organization. She's managed this unit for the last 10 years and works producing technical guidance for countries. So we have a great wealth of experience and expertise here, and I'm sure that we're all going to learn a lot. And I'd like to start with Tessa. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be here with you. Um, and uh, I think this is one of the rare times where I'm not speaking with my peripheral brain on the screen. <laughs> so I have my peripheral brain in the old fashioned way with notes. Um, we, when we talk about making smart choices in universal health care, I would wish to refer you back to um, one of the slides of uh, Jeanette which was on what we call the UHC box. So the question about smart choices um, when you're talking about UHC is not just about the what. What do you provide? What do you cover? But equally about the other questions on who should be covered and at what level of financial protection. I think this is where it takes it beyond the traditional cost effectiveness analysis and health technology assessment is the incorporation of these types of issues. And all of these choices of what, for whom, and at what level of financial protection are essentially trade-offs against each other. I will tell you about our country. Our country is one of those where we've decided to cover the very, very poor, the first 20%, using government uh, tax monies uh, because our government has an explicit policy to actually improve the condition of the poor. And then we have the employed sector, both private and government. So we have the problem, which I again refer to Jeanette, the missing middle. At the same time, this particular package of services, we have, uh, we cover, we provide, uh, renal dialysis, kidney transplantation. We also offer cataracts. Now, why would that be? Did it just happen that our Minister of Health used to be a transplant surgeon? Or that one of the board members of the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation is an eye surgeon? So, these are just facts. I'm not implying anything. I asked the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, how do you make decisions? They have a committee. They have a process. That's what they say. But then we have this very patchy and sometimes uh, I would call it unusual set of services being provided. But the question then is, should you continue expanding this set of services? We're adding cancers already. Or should we think about really the middle poor or the informal sector, the missing middle, because it's a trade-off. What we can spend for providing more services, we can also spend for providing across the board, maybe a smaller set of services, but covering everybody. How do we answer those questions? 
who answers those questions? I think that's a very important thing when we're thinking about universal health coverage. And so where do we get guidance? The global health community says, or the global community says, well, let's look at the uh, sustainable development goals for post-2015, where every president of the members, uh, member states of the United Nations will sign up in September 2015. We're done with the Millennium Development Goals. We're thinking about the new set of goals and what is it that will be in the SDGs. It's going to be, this is the proposal. Let me, this is why I need my notes. The health goal proposed is ensure healthy lives and promote well-being at all ages. Sounds like health for all, no? Anyway, the explicit target is to increase life expectancy by six years in developing countries and two years in developed countries. You know, if you get six years in developed countries, you might get too old. So two years in developed countries, including a 40% reduction in deaths before the age of 70. The indicators are life expectancy at birth and number of deaths under 70. There is an explicit, for the very first time, we learned from the MDGs, there is an explicit equity aspect to this, which is reduce the gap between the poorest and the whole population. And the target is to reduce the mortality figure, uh, the mortality before age 70 by 50% among the poorest compared to the overall. So there are these goals, but how do you actually flesh out? How will I decrease a premature mortality before the age of 70? How will I increase the life expectancy? We have eight sub-goals. We have goals on the usual suspects, HIV, TB, malaria, non-communicable disease is now present, mental health is now present, injuries is now present, suicide is now present, uh, alcoholism is also there, and neglected tropical disease, the whole caboodle is there. The problem now is how will we select among the many interventions that are implied in order to reach these goals. We cannot afford all of them. And I think this is where we say, we still need to set priorities. This sustainable development goals, this health goals, this eight sub goals, they need to be prioritized. And the last sub goal is the sub goal of universal health coverage where it says access to an essential set of services and 100% financial protection. Now, what will be this set of essential services? There is a core set of indicator <coughs> services, but each country will decide what is that set. And what can we now say to these countries? How do you decide which set this is? I think from WHO, what we offer are mainly two things. We offer a set of cost-effectiveness analysis, which we call the choice program. This is choosing interventions that are cost effective, which now looks at the main interventions against all of these conditions using a standardized method. So it allows you to legitimately compare the cost effectiveness ratios. So this is one set. The other set is, a, is, is the other tool is actually a tool about process. We assembled a consultative group of ethicists economists and country people, and we ask them, what is the right process? How do you make the trade-offs? And so there is a guidance which is called making fair choices on the path of universal health coverage. It's one of the very few uh, uh, statements from WHO which basically says what the SDG sub-goal of UHC now says, which is really the first thing you need to do is get a set of services for everybody. Eliminate this problem of the missing middle. It's about equity. So, but there are other things, and so I would basically say, please refer to these two tools. It's among many in WHO, but it would be very helpful because it addresses both uh, the, the content and the process. And then finally, I think what we I want to ask each of you here is, 
by 2030, how old will you be? How old will I be? That's when we finish the sustainable development goals. And what do we want to see for global health? What do we want to see for universal health coverage? And how will I and you contribute to that goal? We can't let this opportunity pass. So please, we will see each other maybe 2030, and it, we want it to be a celebration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great privilege and honor to be here, and it's great to see my colleagues Tessa and Calypso, with whom I've worked for many years, and uh, on this issue of how do we make the health systems work better. And so today, rather than I was going to have my usual talk, and I said I threw it all out because, you know, the last 20 years, I think the work that Tessa, because everyone has been doing, is valuable, but somehow it is not enough, right? Somehow we have been missing some critical components. So I wanted to throw to you some, a few thoughts, suggestions on where we might need to do some transformative thinking and how we seek solutions. And then I'd like to give just a couple of examples uh, from my own country, Japan, since you've worked, you also <laughs> spoke about Philippines. Um, why do we need a transformative thinking? I see that after the 20 years of my experience, I look back and see that I have been looking at health systems in a traditional mechanical engineering solutions. We have various inputs, components, how do we get evidence? The challenge is first getting the evidence. We've come a long ways. And yet somehow it is not sufficient because healthcare is not a simple mechanical box. It is a complex system, an organic system with complex relationship stakeholders. And to understand and model it, we have to go beyond the, uh, the engineering solution to a much more of a systems analysis, complex systems approach. And I know that many of you have been thinking, but we haven't quite figured out how to translate that into practical policy solutions. And so here are three areas that I think we really need to be much more aggressive in doing evidence-based thinking, analytical thinking, and policy thinking. One is, has been already discussed, is to take the political economy aspect much more explicitly, not as a marginal residual, but as a central piece if we want to achieve universal health coverage as a 2030 goal, then it's not just the technical solution that we need to look at. We really have to understand the political economy and the dynamics, the relationships among the different stakeholders. Because universal health coverage is about equity and necessarily it is about redistribution. I know some people in this country don't like this term, but it is about redistribution and trade-offs and negotiations. So how do we bring that much more into the arena for evidence gathering. And this will require, and to some extent, HTA is bringing that issue through a clear governance and process that brings ethics as well as economic and other evidence together. I think it goes part way, but we need to go further in developing an understanding. It's essentially a social engineering of the governance structure that will allow these trade-offs to become much more of a constructive way. Uh, the first session, um, um, the Chile's experience is actually very valuable in showing how the political process contributed to creating that space, creating the trust. How do we not just leave it to happenstance? How can, can we provide a governance structure, uh, an engineer system that will likely create that kind of a, a, a structure going forward? So that number one is political economy. Number two, how do we bring more of the behavioral sciences, psychological sciences, which is just exploding right now into the field? How do we bring that into this issue that I just read, into social engineering? How do we bring that behavior economics knowledge into how we design the governance structure, the HTA uh, governing steering committee? How do we engineer that? I think that there's a huge scope and opportunity that offers uh, potential solutions. And number three, this explosion of information technology, of big data, social media, this gives us, again, another fantastic tool, as well as risks, in how we can gather evidence data and use it in a way that will contribute towards a more fair, transparent, and open system that brings stakeholders together in a constructive way. It sounds very challenging, so I wanted to turn to uh, some examples from Japan because Japan has taken a very different approach to this um, 
prioritization from, I think, the rest of Europe and, uh, and the US and America, because we have a, come from a very different social cultural perspective. We don't like to take a legal regulatory um, approach in making decisions. We like consensus. We like to do it through a process of constant dialogue within our own um, political social arena. And so I wanted to give you the example of our national fee schedule as a way that we achieve this uh, compromise redistribution system. It is not just the fee. We have a national fee schedule that determines more than 90% of how the health care services are reimbursed. Um, I'd like to emphasize that Japan is mostly private on the provider side. We're 99% private on the ambulatory side, 75% private on the hospital side. So it is a highly private sector driven system and yet we had all come together to agree on a national fee schedule that gets updated every two years through a very intensive horse trading that goes on behind the scenes, which then becomes part of the policy making and decision down the line. Every two years, we get together and agree on the reimbursement schedule for all the items, the huge number of items that is in the benefits package. So the fee schedule is not just the fee schedule. It defines the benefits package in the sense that this is, these are the services for which you'll be reimbursed. It also provides conditions for reimbursement it's not adequate, but it does give some quality conditions. So it is that aspect. But also, it determines the price not in a bureaucratic way or not in a pure market way, but as a combination of using market data with the policy data and then pure politics of interest groups fighting, it, fighting each other out. How does it manage to maintain a, a positive structure? One. Yes, we've been fortunate we have peaceful uh, system for many years. It's a stable system. But a key element of that is that the government provides a certain amount of subsidies. And it tells all the other stakeholders. Every year, the stakeholders include the consumer groups, the municipalities, the insurance groups, the pharmaceutical industry, the medical associations. They all come together with all their stakes, because the reimbursement affects them in different ways, and says, listen, in the coming two years, our subsidy level, our fiscal space will allow us, let's say, 1% increase over the current spend. That's the subsidy that we have to work with. And, it, and, and figure out what the reimbursement rates are. Because if any one group, let's say a pharmaceutical group or some pediatrician, whatever, gets a very favorable ben, uh, a reimbursement rate, and then they make in the next two years a lot of money, it will be at the expense of the other groups because there's a, not a, a certain amount that's set for the subsidy and somehow we have to work around that. So it becomes, so if you take advantage and know that you'll stick out of the thumb, in two years time, your peers, all the other interest group will beat on you. So you, everyone becomes more cautious in a way that they approach. So the trade off and give and take does become a long term relationship. Now I know this is not an easy place to achieve, but in some ways the fee schedule is has been socially engineered to get the trade-offs amongst interest groups to be more responsible towards the, the, the public goods, as it were. And at the same time, there's enough flexibility to allow groups to make the case. Why, for example, we have declining populations. So what do we do with the pediatricians with smaller number of clients? The discussion is, should we allow the reimbursement rate for them to go up so they can maintain an income, so that we have a certain number of pediatricians coming in knowing they will have a reasonable income? I mean, these are the kinds of discussions that this forum allows us to happen. And it is not, as I said, it is not an easy one, but I think that in coming through with some governance structure, uh, we have to find the social engineering that allows this kind of trade-off to take place in a, in a consistent way. I just wanted to take one other example of what is happening now. You know that we're in deficit, and so the fiscal issue is huge. So one of the ways that the Ministry of Health and the, the Ministry of Finance realize is that we really need to move towards a community-based healthcare system. And part of that is that we're, uh, the Ministry of Health has very timidly put forward new legislation, I'll explain why it's timidly, saying they want to give greater role for public health nurses to play a coordinative role in managing, helping to manage care between the clinical 
and the long-term care and social services. Because we want the elderly to be healthy, to stay at home as long as possible, which means we don't want to maximize on the clinical use. So the role of the public health nurses, who are not clinical, are going to be greater. Now, this is getting a huge pushback, predictably, from the medical association. They say, Ooh, we don't want to be put under, the, who do they, what do they know? You can imagine the kind of dialogue they're having. But this is where, again, combination of understanding uh, the transformative shift that needs to take place on the education of health workers and the role of the health workers is just as important as the, the reimbursement rates, which would then go to support that. And so how do we socially engineer a kind of movement in that direction? I feel there is a potential now for us to utilize this big data, social media, and a governance structure that allows these interest groups to come together in a, in a very constructive way. But we also, these, these, by sharing this kind of information, we know that many countries face similar political challenges. The medical associations, the deans of medical schools are very powerful. How can we bring them on board as part of the solution and not make them fear that somehow they're threatened, that, that the trade union effect doesn't undermine the greater goal of achieving universal health coverage? It, it is not an easy thing because the interest groups, politics, are very entrenched in how we behave, us against them. It is part of our human behavior. And so we need to find a social engineering approach that recognizes this and designs this into the way we uh, develop the governance, the regulatory, the dialogue structure. And I think we have a huge agenda ahead of us and I look forward to um, contributing to that discussion. Thank you. Thank you, thanks very much. So let me use a few slides, I apologize. I'm, I'm only gonna use a few of them. Um, most people who have come before have said all the things I would like to, to have said, so perhaps uh, there'll be a little bit of, of uh, repetition. So I guess the question, one of the questions could be what the problem is, why are we here, what are we talking about? Um, and people have, have uh, discussed the problem, certainly Jeanette gave uh, very clear examples from Chile as well as Global. But just to reiterate some of the issues, we do know that there's things out there that are high value are not using, and things that are low value are using, and are using them at scale, and this has implications on equity and on outcomes. Um, and uh, this applies to all of us, not just the poor countries or the middle income countries, it applies to rich countries too, it applies to the US, it applies to the UK. Um, I work for an organization called NICE, we're part of the public sector, we advise the National Health Service. Every day we feature in um, uh, the, the, the public uh, media, the press, and this is from yesterday on, on sort of on my way here, it's not on the plane, I was very pleased to be able to log on using the United uh, Wi-Fi. But, um, so I downloaded this and um, it's exactly what Jeanette said when she started, about the opportunity cost. So um, this is a long piece worth uh, uh, looking up if you're interested goes through the different challenges We're in a pre-election period right now in the UK. We've got elections coming up in May. Basically what it is, it's, it's about uh, what NICE does um, and this idea that if we say yes to something, however important that something may be, um, we, we may be well saying no to other things. Um, and this idea of making trade-offs and choices, making them explicitly will anger people, will, will uh, sadden people, but providing a drug, a technology to one person means that someone else is denied the care they need. And we're having this debate very publicly right now in the UK, and I think that's a really important thing. Um, so to me, priority setting is about a number of things, and people have mentioned some of them. It's about countries' own institutions and processes. It's not about lists that we develop in Seattle, in Boston, in Geneva, in London. It's not about global lists. It's about local lists, it's about local decisions, and it's a political process. It's about setting out ground rules, and, and uh, Akiko mentioned that it's about engineering a governance structure which could well tackle issues like corruption and uh, make uh, people who spend people's, other people's money accountable, and that's really important. It's about quality improvement, and uh, I know uh, Sebastian will talk about quality later. Making quality improvement uh, choices is about making priorities. Quality costs money. It doesn't come costlessly. And that's a big problem with health technology assessment that it has ignored the uh, idea of quality. And equally, quality has tended to ignore costs, but the two go together. Priority setting is about transitioning to a new model of development assistance, and I want to talk a little bit about that, because as countries become richer, as GDPs per capita grow, uh, but still the world's poorest people live in relatively rich countries now. 
how do we reach these people? And it's through healthcare to an extent that acts as an equalizer, benefits packages accessible to everybody. It's about public-public partnerships, and I'm very proud of our work together with the Thai colleagues, and Yot is here, and he'll talk about HICAP. And I believe partnering up with the public sector across the world, rich and poor countries, there's huge potential in making things happen. It's about making donors accountable. It's about measuring as well, and I wonder whether we could have a discussion at some point about sustainable development goals. I appreciate we want to measure things we can measure, but perhaps we're missing things we can't measure, like processes and institutions, and these things matter too. Um, and, and finally, it's about making promises one can keep. So we have very granular packages and making a type entitlements explicit. Uh, we need to be able to, to keep these promises. I'll give you a couple of examples and I'll stop. One is about institutions. We've been working with the government of India for a number of years in the latest draft health plan. They talk about an institutional approach to uh, selecting technologies. Very proud to mention, that's why I put this quote up there. We're the only non-Indian institution mentioned in this policy. But what I want to highlight is the fact that they talk about uh, values, social values. They talk about participatory processes. And I think that's as important, if not more important, than the evidence and the technocratic solutions and quick fixes that a lot of the time the global health community has um, um, edged towards. So it's about procedural fairness, it's about inclusiveness, it's about transparency, it's about independence. I think implementing these things on the ground and what Tessa mentioned about convening people, bringing people together, uh, it's really super important. And I think it hasn't really uh, been emphasized enough in, in the debate uh, recently. A couple of words on uh, aid. I can tell you, DFID, we've got 0.7% of our GDP earmarked for uh, uh, global development assistance in the UK. This is enshrining legislation, but it's huge, huge emphasis on how we can ensure this aid uh, meets two conditions, additionality and sustainability. So what happens as countries become richer, as countries graduate from the Gavi and the Global Fund thresholds, how do we reach these countries? Uh, how do we reach the poor within these countries as uh, inequity also grows as, as countries become richer? But whilst doing all that, we need to ensure aid uh, adds on, doesn't displace on country spending, and it's sustainable. So uh, when we talk about demand uh, for priority setting support for institutions in middle income countries, yes, that comes from governments. We have more money we can spend. But what happens in really poor countries where you've got organizations still like the Global Fund and Gavi, and though the role of these organizations is not as important perhaps as in the past, even the very poorest countries spend more of their own money on, on health, we know that. Only a very few handful of countries have, depend on more than 50% of their health budget on foreign aid. However, a lot of that money that the countries spend, very poor countries spend, goes towards salaries, fixed costs. So when it comes to money they can spend on technology and services, there's, there's really groups like the Global Fund and Gavi who, who still have a very important role to play. So what is the responsibility of those groups and those who fund them to uh, boost priority setting uh, within countries and own institutions? I talked about public-public partnerships. This is a consortium of partners. We work together, um, uh, working with partners in other countries, and I've circled NICE and HITAP because we, as two government organizations, I think this public-public partnership, working together with Ministry of Health in the Philippines, Vietnam, and China, is really powerful and builds trust. And it really, you see, you see fellow policymakers in other countries really wanting to work with us, and I think that's really important. So um, I'll just finish. Um, I mentioned uh, earlier about uh, sustainable development goals. I don't know much about them. Uh, Tessa kindly read out the list and, and it looks daunting and, and important. And again, I want to come back to my earlier point about uh, whether we sort of end up looking for our keys under the light, uh, just because that's what the light is. I think it's really important to think about, consider whether we should be uh, reporting on other things uh, in addition to percentages and, and, and however granular these are and broken down across socioeconomic groups. So do we care about institutions? Do we care about countries, governance? And if we do, how do we measure that? So I'll leave you with this. This was published two years back in, uh, in The Guardian. It was um, a question The Guardian posed, The Guardian magazine, on Saturday. Um, uh, what is the most difficult ethical dilemma facing science? And this was a dialogue between Sir Richard Attenborough and Richard Dawkins, and they were referring to a debate, again, involving NICE and a cancer drug, a bowel cancer drug, which was very expensive, and NICE said we can't afford it. So um, this, this, this was the, uh, um, the top dilemma, uh, as per this debate at least. How far do you go to preserve individual human life? Because as Jeanette said, in the end of the day, it is about individuals, it is about people. 
uh, however much we want to care about our populations as a whole. So how do you make this decision? Um, and I don't have an answer for that, but this is, about, this is what priority setting is about. Thank you. Thank you, Nelly. <coughs> and uh, Stephen, great privilege to uh, be here with you this morning. And uh, not an easy task to be the end of uh, such a, an illustrious panel um, so with some really good um, uh, discussion already. Um, and, and one of uh, the panelists earlier mentioned that there's a need for transformative thinking. And I think that is uh, something that is starting to happen in the pharmaceutical industry as well in terms of how it thinks about and engages with uh, countries that we're talking about here in terms of low and middle income countries on the journey towards universal coverage. And by that I mean that you know, historically the industry has dealt with a lot of those countries or seen a lot of those countries in the sense of being able to sell some products to a segment of the population that could, could pay for them and uh, then on the other hand engage in, in um, aid and other types of programs, donor programs, which would deliver product to, to those who couldn't. And it was a fairly simplistic sort of view, I think, of things. As universal coverage spreads and, and, and gains, you know, we see this in sometimes very ambitious political commitments to um, the extent of movement towards universal coverage, often not matched with a financial capacity to, to really deliver on those things. And that is what it is, that's, that's the reality. And clearly the consequence of that is that you've really got to have some form of evidence-based priority setting that's going to guide health systems, particularly during that initial period of shift on universal coverage. So I think the, the pharmaceutical industry is not um, uh, concerned about the concepts of evidence-based priority setting. You know, we, we're very used to the notion of generating evidence. We have endless discussions about how to better generate the evidence, particularly for, for modern HTA requirements and systems. But the notion that you know, systems uh, are going to rely more on evidence-based priority setting uh, is, is obviously a sensible one. And it's a far better alternative, I think, than having decision-making that is uh, you know, far less clear in terms of how it's made, it's, it's, it's opaque, uh, it's difficult to understand. So in that sense, um, we, we're very comfortable in sort of moving forward with that sort of um, concept and engagement. What we're seeing at the same time as this um, expansion of discussion about universal coverage is a number of international agencies from WHO and the World Health Forum Declaration last year um, and, and a number of others advocating health technology assessment as one of the key tools to achieve that, that sort of evidence-based priority set. And Calypso's organization you know, is at the forefront of being able to be quite um, nimble and, and available to, you know, to help in, in a lot of parts of the world. Um, one of the things that we've thought about a great deal from the industry point of view is um, how that happens and how um, HTA systems and processes get installed into these health systems in this stage of, of evolution and transformation. And I really like one of the charts from Jeanette around the approach in, in Chile because it's it's a good example of what I think we ourselves are starting to talk about as macro HDA. So where you take a, a much more holistic view of health system needs, disease burden, uh, health system capacity and infrastructure, and you sort of work systematically through that to determine not only what do you need, but what's going to be achievable and feasible given all of those constraints that you've got as well. Financial constraints obviously being a very large one of those. And so there is some literature now around the concept of sort of macro, meso, and micro HTA, with macro being that fairly broad, holistic health system approach. Some people use the term meso HTA to think more about clinical pathways and clinical guidelines, which of course is something that NICE in, in England does extremely well by linking its, its technology uh, guidance to clinical guidelines and pathways, very, very practical. And so we see that as being very, very important in a number of these, these situations as well. And then below that you have what we would call micro HDA, which is the way that a lot of people have thought about it historically, which is you know, product B versus product, product A versus product B in terms of um, comparative clinical effectiveness. And not in all parts of the world, but in, in many parts of the world, comparative cost effectiveness. And so I think 
what our uh, consideration at the moment is that um, it's quite challenging to sort of move straight to that micro level of HTA um, in situations where you don't necessarily have the capacity to do that in terms of, of human resources uh, with, the, with the appropriate skill levels, um, and most importantly, data. This is you know, very data-driven sort of work. But some combination of those elements can become a, a, a very viable and feasible way of doing it. An industry is, is very keen to have some sort of seat at the table as, as that sort of those sort of processes get worked through and thought about and installed because we think we can partner uh, effectively in that sort of environment. Um, and, and clearly, you know, when you look across disease burdens and, and disease needs and health system needs, um, as other speakers have said, you know, it's not a one-size-fits-all sort of solution. And so we do see situations where um, more specific micro-HTA is being used to solve one particular problem. Um, for example, I'm aware that the Philippines uh, has worked effectively with HITAP on um, uh, an HTA approach to um, HPV vaccine. You know, so, so dealing with a specific technology at a specific time to say, you know, we, we really need to get that sorted for, for our country. Um, but in the meantime, you know, you have a lot of other things to do. We're also interested in how do you, if you take that sort of macro HTA approach and, and think back to the, to the slide that Jeanette described that, you know, how do you work that through down to the day-to-day -day formulary decisions, which are re is where, from our point of view, from a pharmaceutical industry point of view, is where the rubber meets the road in terms of you know, how you make decisions about what goes on formularies and the, at what prices, et cetera. So it's getting that, that sort of process to flow through, I think. Um, Calypso mentioned about public-public partnerships, and clearly there's a lot going on in that space that is, that is connecting people and, and sharing enormous amounts of information. Um, for those of you who were at dinner last night, I spoke a little bit about public-private partnerships and the way in which some of those are evolving and maturing and, and doing some new and different things, particularly in, in um, NCDs. And I think there are some learnings from some of those about how you get this intersection working between the, the sort of the more macro considerations and the practical delivery of, of um, technologies on the ground. Um, so I think you know we're not a long way apart in terms of, of thinking about this in similar ways, um, and you know if the systems and processes that are being talked about to create a situation where um, we can be part of the discussion, we can um, understand the processes and the thought processes, um, and be able to respond constructively in negotiations that result in formal decisions, then I think we've got a more continuous sort of uh, process in place. Um, and I want to finish really with a, uh, just a quote from Calypso, because I read everything that Calypso writes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this comes from a, a paper, um, I think it was from last year, uh, on affordable cancer care. Uh, with, you know, and, and cancer is a particularly challenging one, I think, for, for many of these countries. You know, there's a lot of things that one can do with low-cost generics for many conditions. But at some point, for some diseases, you've got to start to think about other technologies, slightly more innovative technologies, and how you start to integrate them into the system. And those, those, are, those are big challenges. So in this particular discussion about affordable cancer care, uh, of which Calypso, as I say, was, was, was one of several authors, uh, I thought there was, a, there was a good statement. It says that structural organization and cultural issues are equally important factors, if not more so, in the delivery of effective cancer treatment than expenditure alone. The paper talks a lot about a lot of other things as well, but point that I wanted to make is that it's this consideration of structural, organizational, and cultural issues, which good HTA should do, um, you know, is, is a really big part of it. And I think what um, industry is concerned about is that in some situations where you've got this um, intense uh, affordability issue, because the financial capacity is not keeping pace with the, the universal coverage expansion, then HTA can become a, a cost containment mechanism that, that is there to sort of uh, be, a, be a barrier to adoption of, of um, more costly things. Done well, it obviously is not like that and doesn't have to be like that. Uh, and it's trying to find this uh, balance that does have a broader set of considerations, but clearly with affordability at, at, um, a, as a key part of it. Yeah, thank you. Um,
Well, I'm going to ask a couple of questions and then we can turn it over. Is this on? Okay, okay great. Um, so, so obviously all of you are talking about the social and political implications and that are very country specific, but I'm wondering, at least on some of the more technical aspects of it, which are, need, uh, need some combination of these, is there, can a regional <coughs> approach, it's, it seems pretty uh, resource intensive and it's, um, you know, data intensive and it's technically intensive. Is there some way, is there any room for, for countries to do this sort of collectively at a regional level? Calissa? Um, I think you're right. And I think already countries are, yeah, are doing yeah. this. And I think, you know, with the internet in particular, people look up what um, organizations like WHO uh, publish, um, but also most importantly, what other countries do. Um, so, you know, they would look at what NICE does or um, what HITAP uh, does. There's certain language barriers as well for reports that are put up in, in English. I think there's a lot of uh, cross-checking and there's networks like, um, I, I don't know if uh, you will refer to it, HT Asia Link, which is very much a network of uh, organization across Asia, uh, which facilitates the sharing of information. So I think, I think there's a lot of potential for sharing. Um, uh, I I think the processes need to be local. I think it's important that people own the processes and uh, have buy into the processes. And I think there's also technical barriers regarding costs and resource use and, and all that. Affordability issues, different countries, different budgets, different social values. So all these things uh, have to be taken into account. But uh, I think already there's a lot of uh, work happening across countries. Um, I wanted to raise this issue of the health workforce because what is related to this is because, as you know, um, health labor market is globalizing, regionalizing. You have within the EU the movement, uh, ASEAN is coming up with that. The implication of this is, after all, healthcare is provided by the health workers. And if they come from different medical backgrounds and so forth, and their preferences, and they play an important role in determining what services are provided, then the, the regional globalization offers both opportunity and risks in how these information, knowledge about the, the clinical standards, practices are propagated enough. So I think there are tremendous opportunities and, and it is already happening through the movements, also regionalization of uh, medical schools, uh, nursing schools and others, and sharing of standards, uh, examinations uh, uh, and certification across borders is part of that. So the question is then how will this link with, the, with also the knowledge about clinical practices and so forth, some of which the scientific facts may be global because of uh, the similarities of biology. But what aspects then need to be local? What, um, what needs to be a sovereign uh, decision because of the democratic accountability? Again, this gets down to the governance and how we define that will become increasingly important. I think regionalization, all this is happening, but I think it's happening in a willy-nilly in many ways and uh, having a better understanding of it would be very beneficial. I think, uh, picking up from what Akiko said, the knowledge is global. However, the decisions have to be made locally and these are very political decisions yeah. and you, yeah. they must be able to defend it. Yeah. So I think what you would ask this international agencies who publish this evaluations would be to make it to make it a little bit more detailed to make it a little bit more uh, transparent in terms of how they made the evaluation to provide the background data so that if I do decide in my country not to do my own analysis but to look at somebody else's, I would want to be able to say, yeah, I agree with this. Well, they have a difference in the price. I'm going to put in my own price and I can rerun some of the analysis. But I think this is something which uh, uh, you would hope that uh, people would have the same agreements, but definitely not every country needs to do some form of review. But many of us here who work in international agencies will be able to facilitate this by being more open in terms of the data that we provide, which were the basis for our recommendation. So I think we, it, 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 you can't take out that local process. It's very political. And especially if there are trade-offs and there are winners and losers and there are voices here and voices there, then 
you really have to make sure, as, uh, as Jeanette said, you can uh, stay in the newspapers and keep your head. Um, I think, the, uh, as has been said, the broad skills uh, are definitely transferable, and, and there is a great deal to gain from, from doing that. Um, it is dangerous, potentially dangerous, in transferring one technology assessment decision from, from one place to another. As people have said, it needs to take into account the local context. But I also agree with um, the point that at the end of the day, it's the way in which that process is integrated into the decision making in a country. And I think Jeanette made that point very well in terms of, you know, at the end of the day, it's a political decision. And so the, the playing out of that or application of that HTA in each health system needs to be done locally in the context of, of what the problems of the, of the day are. And so a lot's been made, and, and this is a big issue in the US as well, but about preventive care and behavior change, as you've talked about. And um, this seems like it's a really difficult thing to capture in some of these processes. How do you, how do you capture the cost effectiveness of behavior change? Is that part of any of these methodologies? Is that feasible? Yes. Uh, yeah, 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 it's, it's about who said the agenda, who asked the question, how the question is structured. Certainly global um, donors fund a lot of behavioral change interventions in the HIV world, for example. So there is an evidence base. Now, whether that's consistent with them funding these things is a different story. But the, the, there's, there's evidence and there's ways of capturing. I know in Thailand, HITAP has done a lot of work in a much broader sense of HCA, looking at things from uh, policy interventions to um, behavioral change interventions, prevention. We have a whole program doing prevention in, in the UK, looking at the cost effectiveness of prevention. Um, so it's, it's technically possible. There are data. But again, it depends on the structure of the system and who's, who asks the questions, who pays in the end for, for um, the recommendation of acts and like the recommendation puts money. Or, yeah. Yeah. Just the two points. Um, I think the use of availability of big data and social media have expanded the uh, ability to understand behavioral uh, responses. For example, we, a study on obesity has shown that it's not so much your genetics or biology, but who you know, your peers. So that, in fact, obesity propagates almost like uh, infectious disease in the way your network, your, your connections impact on that. And that kind of data would not have been possible if you didn't have this kind of a uh, lot big data available. And so we're increasing having the ability to do it. I think we're still in the early stages. But as a result, for example, in Japan, I mentioned again, uh, for healthcare, we're seeing more and more the importance of social connectivity so that it's not just about clinical, but also uh, to, be, to make sure Ministry of Finance is interested in preserving fiscal space. So they're very much also pushing towards interventions that show um, a lower cost through having healthy lifestyles, and, and they have collected data on these. And that is why they're promoting and pushing for more home-based care, community-based interventions that includes psychosocial connectivity that re improves your immune system and your ability to uh, fight infections. And in the future, I think the data will be collected whether it affects cancer and so forth down the line. Um, Nelly, I would add that some of that thinking about behavioral change and so on is not only relevant to prevention, but um, you know, there are a number of particularly chronic conditions where um, adherence to treatment is, is such an important issue. And um, it, there is a lot that can be said and done about um, you know, matching the availability of the treatment with efforts to ensure that uh, both uh, health professionals and patients you know, have the right understanding about how that treatment should be used to, to actually get the, uh, the optimal result. So you know, it's, it's not something to be ignored on the, on, the, on the treatment delivery side either. Well, and one last question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Just, just to say that I, I think from the prevention part is actually where you start thinking about more intersectoral actions in terms of policies. So if you look at the Sustainable Development Goals, it says to decrease the uh, mortality from road traffic accidents by 50%. I'm not going to really tackle that in my small essential package of services. I would probably tackle that through policies and talking with the Department of Transportation in the same way that 
obesity and all of this uh, other you know, non-communicable disease, you would basically be thinking really about the very strong impact of behavior modification by certain policy changes like uh, tax, taxing uh, cigarettes or alcohol or, or uh, putting in incentives for manufacturers to decrease sugar, et cetera, et cetera. I think all of this uh, is still, for me, part of health, but yeah. more intersectoral. And really, this is where we can probably have the most gains yeah. for many of these conditions. We will not be able to achieve it within health alone, our yeah. usual definition of health. Well, and sort of on the flip side of that, how in these processes do you preserve space for innovative um, interventions that are obviously could potentially be costly initially? <laughs> Um, what's the, how do you create space for that? <laughs> we didn't prearrange this. <laughs> this is um, I think, I think, it, I mean, I think there's, again, it's a cross-sectoral thing. I, mean, I think it wouldn't be fair to ask the health budget alone to support uh, innovation. Uh, and in R&D, there should be money for research and development because we want the innovations that enter the system on an uncertain evidence base to be evaluated because otherwise we don't know whether they're killing people or saving lives. Uh, we want to have a good industrial policy that supports um, wherever it is you're standing and what level development you are, homegrown industries, overseas industries. Um, we want to have a strong regulatory system that attracts foreign direct investment. Um, so I think my answer would be that um, we, we need not to ask too much of the health budget. Certainly in a, in a current time of uh, uh, recession, uh, the con major concern right now is to cover as many people as we can with things we know work and cut waste. Um, and beyond that, I think there's lots of different budgets in government, different ways from patents to an IP rights to, as I mentioned, industrial policies to help encourage innovation. I, I would agree, obviously, with, um, with that at a broader policy level. Um, you mentioned um, the regulatory side of things. And you know there are countries where um, the the lack of a of a well uh, operating regulatory sector is as much a barrier to, to access to, to some of these um, innovative medicines as anything else. But I think in practical terms about how one can start to integrate some of them into um, an evolving health system, um, there is a lot to be um, discussed. I think about the concepts around appropriate use. So in other words. You know, making something available does not mean to say that everybody should get it. You know, um, and there is a lot of expertise developed in, in some health systems around different, quote, appropriate use strategies, which can mean that you, um, you know, targeting the availability of that treatment to the, the patient group where it's likely to be most effective and most cost effective. And that can be done through, through various uh, ways. Brazil, for example, has got quite a an established system now of um, using uh, expert clinical groups to develop um, clinical guidelines, and the only way that one gains uh, reimbursed access to, to a number of higher cost, more specialized treatments is by adherence to that set of guidelines which have been developed through, through a clinical consensus. So there's a whole range of tools that can be used in, in, in those ways. So I think the, the appropriate use concept is, is useful. Well, I would like to pose this issue with transforming medical education. I was originally trained as a biochemist. It always struck me how different the medical students were from those who were doing scientific research, a different culture. And the healthcare industry has often been more, cons more conservative in adopting different types of technologies. That's a huge area. Because I see that there is a tsunami of innovations already in the pipeline that's coming. In Japan, it's the robotics, the material sciences, which is way outside of the the traditional clinical science field, and that's going to transform the way healthcare writ large is going to be provided. And I'm sure that uh, through nanotechnology, there'll be a huge amount of new things that'll be coming up. The challenge for us is how can we, and they tend to, at the moment, increase the cost, but how can we incentivize the industry, the researchers, to come for low cost uh, solutions, which are possible, like what happened in IT? That's not happening often enough. For universal health coverage, we've got to innovate for low-cost solutions. And I think that should also be possible, but I think we need to find ways to really 
incentivize the groups to, to find these kinds of solutions. I don't have an answer for that, but that's something we need to challenge ourselves. Okay. Yeah. I, I like innovation. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. It's, uh, I was in a, I thought a, a, a boring meeting with logisticians yesterday, and we were talking about how to get the commodities to everywhere, geographic access. And so we were looking at what, we, what would we need, and, and they were talking about, you know, from simple things like boats to get to this, but then, then we were, they were talking about drones and et cetera. So I, I think the, 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 think about the next 15 years. It's going to be the most exciting 15 years, and I'm happy we'll be here <laughs> in those 15 years. It will be very challenging, but I think this wave of potential innovations from the smallest uh, genetic-based medicine to drones and robotic surgery, it's not going to be there for everybody, but we have to try to make it at least to the extent maximum available for everybody. I mean, it's let us not uh, increase the inequity in this world in the next 15 years, we should really be looking at this. All right, so questions from the audience. Um, we'll collect a couple of them. Can you identify yourself, please, and keep sure. it short? Uh, Claudia Morrissey Conlin with uh, USAID Maternal and Child Health. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Vega and the panelists for really a very stimulating conversation, particularly around the issues of prioritization. And my question to the panel and to Dr. Vega, if she wants to take this, is I don't hear a lot about instances where we say yes in order to be able to say more yeses. It's always we say yes to, to something we're going to put on our essential service package, so, but we have to say no. And I, it seems to me the discussion of the epidemiologic ecology, if you will, is very stable and very static here. Um, and that I believe all of us want to reach universal health coverage, not only because it's the right thing to do, but also because it then rationalizes our use of resources so we can say yes to more things. So I'd like more discussion about this policy box being more malleable, and, and what in the next 15 years can we garner by saying yes now? Uh, well, maybe we'll just, oh, Daniel? Thanks. Hi, I'm Daniel Kotler from the World Bank. And uh, this is mostly to do with uh, with a point Calypso mentioned in one of the slides. There's a lot of uh, technologies that are great and have not been taken to scale. Um, so in the bank, we were trying to, we were doing a comparison of 24 countries. And one of the things we wanted to know was, let's identify 10 things that are great, but have not been taken to scale and let's understand in each of these 24 countries, what's the problem with them. So we were looking for 10 great things mm -hmm. that have not been taken to scale. Um, and we couldn't find that list. Maybe we checked in the wrong place. Is, is there such a list? Um, and I wanted to combine this with a, a surprise perhaps, uh, that came out of the work done by the Commission of Investing in Health. Uh, they have this uh, estimation of what it would cost to achieve convergence. And they do that estimation based on some technologies that they've identified and have not been taken to scale. But all those technologies are uh, referred to communicable disease, and maternal and child um, care. So perhaps my question is, many of the countries that are going, that are doing universal health coverage are expanding beyond that basket. Are there 10 things that you would say 
people around the world have reached a consensus, are great, are cost effective, but have not been taken to scale. Thanks. Why don't we take these two questions because they're complicated. So, um, Calypso, do you want to start off? I'll start with Daniel's question since it was addressed. I think it's a really good question, and I apologize if the impression I gave was that um, one could devise a list of things that applies globally, of things that are underused and everybody should, should use. And I do have my own my reservations about the lists in the uh, Investing in Health uh, Commission papers uh, about how these lists were derived what data were used and how this data could possibly have been applicable to all these different countries in the world simultaneously. Um, so I think I, I can think of things, however, at the country level. And in order to identify those things, you do need to have a process. So for example, I can tell you that uh, um, in secondary prevention, for instance, for cardiovascular episodes, MIs, strokes, is, is certainly not done uh, enough in countries like China. For instance, so you have a stroke, you have a stroke really early in your life, so that's a primary prevention gap. But then you go home and there's no system to ensure you're on, put on a chip, antihypertensive, antiplatelet, if unless contraindicated, etc. So you go on to have a second stroke, and then that's if you either die or you're out of the workforce. There's, there's issues, there's gaps still in vaccination. We're looking with colleagues in Colombia, for instance, there's regions in Colombia that still have less than 50% of the basic vaccine coverage and Colombia pays for a vaccine for indications that are even licensed in this country. So, uh, you know, talking about diabetes in, in India, where the poorest of the poor, there's no, there's no means of raising awareness or, or monitoring people so they go on to have an amputation, lose their sight to end their end stage renal disease, um, which has catastrophic costs, uh, cost implications for the family. So I think there are things uh, countries could be doing, should be doing, the same applies in the UK. We know that there's for, for type 1 diabetes, care is only 30% of people get the recommended care based on guidelines, clinically and cost effective care in the UK. So that's, that's usually problematic. Mental health is another major area. So I think there are, there are cases, but I don't believe in lists. I don't believe in global lists. I don't believe you can have a list and say, look, these are the 10 things everybody should do and they're cost effective. I don't believe in that because I think it's technically tricky because it's about resources. And I don't believe in it because procedurally, doesn't make sense. If you want people to do things, pay their own money, they need to go through a process that they've built, that they run, they've buy, bought into, have a conversation, and then they decide to spend their own money. How would the United States feel? WHO said, here's a list of 10 things, and you should do them. Would you, would the government say, okay, well, WHO said, so we'll do these 10 things. It doesn't work like that. Countries need to decide themselves. So the best you can do, I think, is work together to exchange experiences around the processes, uh, but, but not to share a list. So I, th I think, you know, I, I agree with you. I, don't, I couldn't come up with a list of 10 things that uh, everybody should do and everybody's not doing. Sorry. First question, yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll respond. Okay. First question about uh, how is it that we're always saying yes more and more and more. Of course, there is a pressure, as we said, if you look at the behavioral sciences, people want more. As an individual, you want to have access to all, but how do we get that trade-off? So I think the discussion here was at the public level, at the collective level, how do we get that trade-off decisions done? Because yes, maybe you're saying yes on paper, but de facto, the countries that we work in, in fact, people are not getting, getting services implicitly or explicitly, a lot of times implicitly, if the budget's not there, even if it's supposed to be there, if the drug is not there, a drug runs out halfway through the month, and so de facto, those who come at the letter, these, actually, these rationings are actually happening everywhere. What we're hoping for through HDA is at least to make it more transparent, so it's not, un, it's not implicit and somehow covered up, because then the poor, the underserved, the, the marginalized groups, are the ones who suffer the most from this. How can we make it more transparent? And again, there's no easy answer, but how can we get a, a country, a community, to have a more transparent discussion, to have a fair understanding of the trade-offs? It's not gonna be easy, and it's, it's always gonna be a negotiated approach, but I think that's one of the, the biggest challenges that we, we all face. Um, David? Um, just a, a, a couple of comments related to <clears throat> that question. So within um, HTA circles of, of, of people who get together to talk about HTA, uh, there is also the notion of disinvestment. So the idea that you know, there are going to be various technologies that are 
no longer regarded yeah. as, as useful or, or suitably effective or cost effective. And active disinvestment is something you now start Excellent. to see in, in some systems. Sort of related to that, but a, but a, a different um, concept is that of um, concept of headroom for innovation. And so this is probably something that's applicable in, in health systems you know, on the more developed end, but um, maybe not. Uh, th there are a number of situations where uh, even generics uh, prices are higher than they perhaps should be for all sorts of reasons um, related to supply chains, markups, taxes, all, all manner of things. And uh, there are some examples now where um, industry in a, in a broad sense has worked with governments to figure out you know, how do we readjust some of that structure so that there is in fact more quote headroom for innovation so that you know, yes can be said more uh, in, without necessarily disturbing the whole, uh, the whole ecosystem. Uh, I think to respond also to the first question, um, in order to deliver this, to, to really guarantee the package, I think it takes a lot of things to do. It, it, it will take a lot of things in order to deliver it, to make sure that it's guaranteed and everybody gets it. But the idea, I think, as well, is it's a progressive realization, is the term used, where you start with a basic set, you ensure that you deliver it well with the quality that will give you the uh, health benefits. And then you gradually expand with many of these countries with HR problems, with logistics problems. You really have to make sure that what you promise is actually what you deliver and you make the government accountable for that. I think the, the key thing is, is really um, it's it's to say we're starting, but it will become bigger. But we want to make sure that everybody gets it. It's, it's, it's very important that you, and this is why I believe that some countries who go with negative lists, you're not going to get there. You really have to make it an explicit list because then you can focus the efforts of the government in terms of governance, you know, and then at the same time, you can have accountability and you can have the ability of everybody to be able to claim it. If you don't make it explicit, you cannot claim anything. Nobody can go up to the health center and say, I want to deliver and I don't need to pay. You, you, you have to be able to say that to, to a mother, to a pregnant mother. You can deliver anywhere and you don't have to pay anything. That's very powerful to our audience. And I think this is what we want to make sure. You make it explicit. You have to people know about their rights, what their claims are. And you make sure that the providers know it and deliver it well. And you start with that. And then we grow it. Well, unfortunately, we have run out of time. Uh, can I, I guess, do yeah, you have a quick one? Yeah. Yeah. This is a very, this is an extremely interesting question, because what happened is that, and there are two examples that I think of, and it's it's not in the process of defining the benefit packages, it's in the process of updating it and moving forward. What what happens, for example, is that as a general principle, it's good to move forward, thinking and going more towards prevention, and and because when you do that, basically the money is spent more efficiently. So for example, we are moving now, and it could, hap it could appear to be very, very unimportant. We are in a process of implementing throughout the country peritoneal dialysis, dialysis instead of the uh, usual dialysis. Why is that? Because basically, it's much less expensive, and then you can provide more. It, it has much better outcomes. Therefore, you basically can uh, uh, decrease the complications, and therefore, you can decrease the money that you are spending in providing uh, uh, the, the classic dialysis for, right, so that's one. The other example that I can think of is the, the issue related to drugs. Sometimes you provide more in terms of more expensive drugs, but those drugs that are more expensive can, in fact, 
uh, be much better in terms of complications. The example that comes to my mind is biological uh, drugs for rheumatoid arthritis, which is an example. So that's the thing that you have to be dealing permanently with new knowledge, with cost effectiveness, and at the same time with the population health approach, which is moving toward more uh, prevention and promotion. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have 10 minutes, and we're going to hold you to it for a quick break, and we'll set up our second panel here. Um, help yourself to coffee, and we'll be right